In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We are here in New Orleans as part of this pilgrimage, and it's kind of one of the highlights of the pilgrimage. Tomorrow we shall see the tomb of Father Francis Silos, and there are many miracles worked to his name. And there's also the Shrine of St. Anne, and the famous pilgrimage site of Our Lady of Perpetual Succor, Our Lady of Perpetual Help. So we will go there and pray and beg Our Lady for all the graces that you'll ask for, that all of us will ask for, uh, of Our Lady. So many miracles have been worked in these shrines. God is pleased to show His blessing over these shrines. For example, way up in Canada, in Quebec, I've done many, several, numerous boys' trips up there. And when you go to St. Anne's Basilica, there's the relic of the arm of St. Anne, her bone of her arm. She's the grandmother of Christ. She would have held the baby Jesus in her arm. And there's crutches, just walls and walls of crutches, and even more stored in the basement of people cured through St. Anne especially before Vatican II, before uh, they brought in the new Mass. Just thousands and thousands of crutches. And same with St. Joseph's Basilica in Montreal, which was built by Brother Andre, a humble brother. He had such a powerful and loving devotion to St. Joseph. He put all his trust in St. Joseph for everything. And when they were constructing the church, they ran out of funds, and they said, no more money, no more work. And he said, no, take this statue, put it on the platform where the concrete foundation is. And if St. Joseph wants a roof, he'll get one. And they did that, and the money started coming pouring in again, and they con con could continue the construction. And now it's a beautiful oratory of St. Joseph. And, of course, it's ugly because they finished the upper part after Vatican II, so it's all modern and ugly modern art which Brother Andre would never have accepted. But nevertheless, the lower part is still traditional, and there's tons of miracles through Brother Andre and also through St. Joseph. Many, many miracles, and there's walls and walls and walls of crutches. So God uh, is pleased to bless these shrines, places that are holy, temples of God. And it is worth to go to these temples. It is worth to go to these shrines and to ask special graces. It's been a, a Catholic practice from day one. Even the apostles from, from the very start, they would always come back every year to Jerusalem to join with Our Lady, Angelo stop, to join with Our Lady and uh, venerate her and, and do Easter week together. Even the apostles made pilgrimages and then uh, the, the famous pilgrimages in Europe are Santiago de Compostela, where the tomb of St. James is. That's where you can walk. Uh, I've, done, I've done, what, I think we did 480 miles on foot, a priest and I. And, uh, and then you can, some start from France, some start from England, some start from all over the world, or some just start from 50 miles away or even 10 miles but it's always a pilgrimage. And then, of course, the biggest pilgrimage of all is the Holy Land, where Christ walked. You can see where he was born in Bethlehem. You can see where he was crucified and where he was buried. You can see even where Our Lady uh, fell asleep in her holy death and then was assumed into heaven. You can see Mount Tabor, where Christ was transfigured, and the, the hill of the Beatitudes overlooking the Sea of Galilee and where our Lord preached many times, and Capernaum, where he preached and worked many, many miracles. You can see Genesareth, where he drove the, the devil out of one man. He had tons, legions of devils in him. Christ cast them out into the swine, the pigs, and the pigs went running full speed off the cliff. And as they were running, they were, their bodies were so hot, they were burning and singeing the grass. And they threw themselves off the cliff down into the splashing into the waters below and steaming hot and drowning in it. And before long, you had all these upside down 
big bellies of pigs floating. And that you can all see. This is the beauty of our Catholic faith. It's so rooted in reality. Joseph Smith of the Mormons wears his famous golden plates written by some angel. Nowhere. They can't find them. He can't produce the evidence. And it's such a phony religion, the Mormons. It's not even... It's not even... It's a really a cult. They do not recognize Christ as God. They say he's... He's, well, he's a son of the Father and, and brother to Lucifer. And Lucifer, his children were all the black race. That's what they used to teach. But now, since the 50s, it's so... <laughs> It's so politically incorrect, they had to change their doctrine. So what religion changes its doctrine? Well, all false ones do. And same with Protestantism, always changing. And you boys must be aware of the danger today out there of the religious indifferentism. You have to remember, the popes have condemned this over and over and over again. Pius VI, Gregory XVI, Pius IX, Pius the uh, 10th, of course, Leo the 13th, Pius XI, down to Pius XII, they, they took the 50-gauge shotgun and blasted this error called religious indifferentism. And we're very prone to it here in our liberal Western culture. And you're going to meet a lot of people, and you already have, I'm sure, oh, I'm Christian. You're Catholic? Oh, you're Christian. You're Baptist? Oh, you're Christian. You're Episcopalian? Oh, you're Christian. We're all Christian. We all believe the Bible. That's our common denominator. And that's very dangerous. Very extremely dangerous to come to that thinking that we're just one big nebulous Christian unity. That's very false. Remember, God is jealous. He said, I am a jealous God. And Israel has, has uh, committed adultery. Israel has gone to false religions. And that's why he punished the uh, boys. You got to stop using the bathroom during mass. I didn't bring Girl Scouts, okay? During mass, of, of course, there's an emergency, no problem. And if you got the runs, no problem, understood. But during mass, you don't run to the bathroom. That's why you got time before. Use the bathroom before and use it after. But unless you got diarrhea, unless you got to throw up, unless you got a severe running nose, no problem, but when you're back at your, when going to Mass with your family, don't be one of those idiots who run off every time there's Mass going on to the bathroom or just walking around in the basement. Don't do that. that, that that's not right. And your fathers should not permit this. So um, there's no problem if you've got a, a real, you know, problem. But especially you little ones, don't be running off to the bathroom. Uh, this is a, a big boys camp, so you're only here because we're just filling in some seats. So respect the mass, right? So um, so the shrines that we are going to vis be visiting, ask Our Lady some great graces. Ask the help of God especially to know what God wants you to do. And if you already know what you're supposed to do, ask that you be a saint in what you do, that you really excel for the glory of God in what you do. If you're meant to be married, that you be a good father and a loving father who loves and cherishes his wife, who doesn't scream at her and yell at her and treat her like trash. No man should ever do that to his bride. St. Paul always says that, cherish and love your wives, cherish and love them, and you have to listen to them also, and listen to their complaints. And, and if, uh, as a father, you've got to provide for your family, but remember the first important thing for a man, for his family, is not to provide food and pay the bills. That's important, and it is the man's job, but it's not the most important job. The most important job of the father is to teach the faith to his children and lead the prayers, or at least make sure they're said. So if, if, if the father has to be away for work for a week or some days, like truckers or doctors on a summit seminar, 
then uh, you make sure you, you know your wife continues the daily rosary and the teaching of the faith. And if it's homeschool, um, the father has to overlook it and not just leave it to the mother and dump all that work on the mother and not have anything to do with the homeschooling of the children. He's got to look at their exams. He's got to look at their homework, see if they're doing it right. Right? This is all part of the father's. And a good father must be like St. Joseph. He provides. He's the spiritual father of the house. He's the provider. He's the defender. And he also connects the family to the political society, that is, with the city, with, with where you live. And we need really a union of fathers throughout the United States. We need, a, we need a, like a guild of fathers to study the papal encyclicals and begin to reestablish the reign of Christ the King in society. This is important. This is your generation, gentlemen. Your generation has to do this to take practical steps for the reign of Christ the King. And the, there's been heroes before you, great heroes, 20, 30, in the last 50 years, defending Catholic tradition, standing up against abortion, standing up against the sodomite garbage, standing up against the, uh, the corruption, especially in the public schools, where they're now aggressively teaching the whole rainbow agenda, aggressively. And uh, good American fathers have stood up against this, and mothers as well. And now uh, the, the U.S. government is, is labeling them terrorists. Biden, the idiot, calling them terrorists. F pure foolishness. But we have to be willing to die and lay down our life for the reign of Christ the King, for the Holy Catholic faith. So there is only one faith. Have that very clear. There's only one bride of Christ. There's not two brides of Christ, or three, or four, or five. One bride. And that bride is this holy Catholic Church. And when we, now we have to make another distinction. We say we are, belong to the Roman Catholic Church, but we don't belong, and we reject this conciliar church of Vatican II. Archbishop Lefebvre always made this distinction. As he said in his great declaration of 1974, we adhere with all our heart to Catholic Rome. We adhere with all, the, all our heart to the mistress of truth, the Holy Catholic Church of Tradition. But we refuse the Church of Vatican II, the conciliar church since the Second Vatican Council. We refuse the new Mass. We refuse the new sacraments. We refuse the, all the reforms of Vatican II, which are destroying our Catholic Church. And this is very important that you have this clear in your mind, because Bishop Follet, and the leaders of the new SSPX, they have no longer made the, they no longer make this distinction. So they say we belong to the Catholic Church, which includes the, the conciliar church. And that's why they're being absorbed slowly into the conciliar church. Very dangerous. Language is very serious. Language is important. And the Catholic Church always defends correct and clear language in her tradition. That's why Vatican II is fuzzy in its language, double meaning in its language. It has time bombs set in the Vatican II documents that the bishops could interpret afterwards to the destruction of the church or to appear more conservative. Uh, a very common example that's, that stands out is the document on the liturgy in Vatican II, which says Latin will remain the language of the church. Sounds great, doesn't it? But in the next paragraph, it says, however, the bishops may use the vernacular where they see fit. So wait, is Latin going to remain the language of the church? Or are the bishops going to be able to overthrow it and bring in vernacular, such as English in the English-speaking countries? Which is, which is it? And there were big fights over this. And traditional bishops will say, well, Vatican II teaches Latin is the language of the church, so we're going to keep Latin. But the liberal bishops will say, no, but it says we can use vernacular where we see fit. And we have, uh, uh, we have kids in our parish, and they need to understand the liturgy. We have to put it in English. So there you go. That's a time bomb in Vatican II documents. Just one of the many time bombs, which is diabolic. The devil, the devil swims in ambiguity. He swims 
like alligators in the swampy waters. You know that the alligators, when they, when they attack their victim or they're hungry, it's lunchtime, they sweep their tail on the bottom of the swamp or the little ponds that you saw all, all throughout Florida. They sweep their tail and they stir up all the mud and muck. And then they open their mouth, which is all white on the inside. And the fish are panicking in, in this confusion. And they think they're going to the light, to the top of the waters, to, towards the light, which is white. But many of them are deceived and they, they take the white lining of the alligator's interior of his mouth for the sky and chomp. The alligator has four or five fish for lunch. That's how the devil works. That's why Archbishop Lefebvre said the Vatican II documents are poisoned through and through. Even though not every sentence may be heretical, the heresy soaks it like a, a rum cake soaked in poisonous rum, and you, you just stay away from it. This has to be very clear, but this, you also must see the liberalism we must fight, which is those traditional bishops and traditional clergy who now, even sons of Archbishop Lefebvre, are trying to justify Vatican II, justify the new mass, and even promote it, sad to say, even promote it as grace-giving, as miracles of the new mass, as true, and all that. And that the new mass nourishes your faith. The, uh, yeah, which is, I mean, it's laughable to teach this. It's just laughable because it's so contrary to the facts, to the reality of the evidence of the new mass. The fruit of the new mass is loss of faith, apostasy. So you boys, you're lucky. You've been raised in the traditional mass, but you got to understand the war we're in. And you're the next generation. You're the next generation of priests, of brothers, of fathers of families that have to build for the reign of, the, of Jesus Christ the King over the United States of America. That's your job in your life. And, and that's your first duty, really. And then your wife. And then your children. And then all that pertains to the home. But the father has one step in the political world and he has one step in the family world. And he has to build Christ up in both. And that's why Father Matteo, a great priest in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, he preached everywhere throughout the world by order of St. Pius X, the home enthronement of the Sacred Heart. To enthrone your, enthrone your house to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And also enthrone your business. I know many boys we've had on many uh, pilgrimages for the last 30 years, now many of them own their own businesses and they many of them have consecrated their business to the sacred heart of jesus which is the correct and right thing to do and i've done it i've come to an office and he has uh, one one businessman traditional catholic he uh ran a business making uh, instruments and items for for dentistry and he consecrated his business to the sacred heart of jesus uh, there's a big mis business in St. Mary's, Kansas, Onyx, run by the Arakamps. Mr. Arakamp, he, he, there's no work on the, on the Holy Days of Obligation. All the men go home. If they're, if among his workers, the bigger families, the fathers of larger families, they get a larger salary. That's a proper way to run a business. And he consecrated, many years ago, consecrated his business to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And the business is just booming. He's just booming. And that's what you must do. And uh, This is the domain of the men. And we must promote the kingship of Christ and fight the political corruption as much as we can. But we also must rebuild. Remember in the scriptures, there was a time when the Jews had to rebuild the walls, but they, they were also at war. So with one hand, they laid, they laid the concrete like a stonemason laid the concrete and putting up blocks. On the other hand, they had their sword ready for battle to be attacked. So with one hand, they built up the city. The other hand, they defended it. So that's, that's pretty much the 
what a Catholic man and soldier is about now. We have to build, with one hand, build the Catholic Church again, build from the foundations. We need seminaries again, monasteries again, faithful to tradition, with no compromise with Vatican II for the new Mass. And we need fathers to rebuild Catholic businesses and Catholic families. So we ought to rebuild on one hand, on the other hand you have to fight. You have to fight the errors of our age. The errors of especially modernism that attack the sacred scripture and say that Genesis was just a myth. And now you have an, uh, can you believe this, a, a Society of St. Pius X priest. This, this, this would never happen under Archbishop Lefebvre, never. But uh, Father Paul Robinson, pray for him, but he's published a book that promotes evolution that the world is 13.8 billion years old. What's he doing? What nonsense, what fables, what fiction? What's wrong with the superiors to permit this? And his book is being sold in all the bookstores and was heavily promoted by the superiors. How is this possible? Evolution, you, you heard just some great common sense arguments against evolution the other day. And how is it possible that a priest of tradition is promoting this and on top of that himself gets promoted? He should be set to make a retreat and, and, and scrub toilets at the seminary for a few years and restudy the encyclicals of Pope Pius X that condemn the modernism that attacks the book of Genesis and the book of Apocalypse. And the St. Pius X even shows that the modernists don't stop there. They don't stop at Adam and Eve calling them a fiction and that the flood of Noah was just a nice story to tell, to make people feel good. And that Jonah being swallowed by the whale was just a, a nice story to convey some meditation uh, thoughts. This is what the modernists do. They attack the scriptures. And they don't stop there, says St. Pius X. They even attack Christ himself. So they will say that the miracles of Christ were just meditations of the apostles. That Christ never really performed miracles, nor was he just truly God. He was just a very holy man in tune with the deity. All this is blasphemy. All this is deeply perverse, satanic, said St. Pius X. But he said this was over a hundred years ago in the seminaries, in the clergy, in the bishops. It was, he said it's in the intestines of the church. It's like a, a parasites in your intestines that eat, eat your insides. And when you eat food, they eat it so you don't get nourishment. That's how you know you got parasites. As you get thinner, you eat a lot, but you get thinner and thinner and weaker and weaker. That's what parasites do. And you need tinctures and you need whatever to, to wash them out, to kill them. And this happens to dogs a lot, because they eat close to the ground. So the parasites in the church are modernism. And you have to fight this. You must, you have to build up your, the good arguments against evolution, because this is one of the biggest errors and lies today. Evolution. That the earth is billions of years old, that we all evolved out of some primordial soup, that we all evolved out of some common ancestor, that some squid that crawled out of a paw of a little pool of water. Just all baloney, all fiction, all lies. And you heard that from uh, um, Ken Hovine, who I encourage you, he has a lot of talks on, on internet. He's still a Baptist, so pray for his conversion. But a lot of these Protestants are on the front line of this battle where Catholics should be there. It should be, there is the Colby Center out in California. They do a lot to refute evolution also. But you have to build up your defense against evolution. You've got to study. And you've got to study to defend the Catholic faith. When Catholics say to you, oh, why do you worship Mary? Well, you say, well, we don't worship her as God. She herself worships God. But we venerate her as honored by God because she's the mother of God. Oh, mother of God. Well, you're saying she's mother of God, that she was there from all eternity? Well, no. But because God, the second person of the Trinity, became man, and the fact that God never was a man before, but was born on Christmas night 
in Bethlehem, he was born of a mother, and that mother was the Virgin Mary. And since Christ is God, and Mary is the mother of Christ, Mary is the mother of God. You see, simple arguments to defend the faith, but also to be, to be strong, strong in the faith so that we ourselves grow in the love of God. We have to grow in the love of God and not just be defending the faith, but we must love God ourselves by, by a life of prayer, contemplation, closeness to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Mary, and especially the daily rosary wearing her scapular all these so uh and then the great errors of our modern age are so many there's so many freud and his deadly poison his psychology and his psychiatry which said man is just a he's just a lustful animal that's basically what freud says he's just driven by lust and and then da darwin um, Freud, and of course Karl Marx. Karl Marx with his Communist Manifesto is taking over the world, as Our Lady of Fatima said. Socialism is taking over the world. It's taking over. That's why we're watching the United States crumbling because of socialism. And the Democratic Party and the Republicans as well, they're all for socialism, with rare exception. So these are the things we must be aware of and fight against. And we do need Catholic politicians, but I don't think in the American system, you can't get far unless you're a Freemason. And some of you boys may be approached with this. If you advance far and do well in engineering or do well in medical world or do well in, in any, uh, any career, you're gonna have Freemasons approach you and say, look, We'll give you extra money, we'll give you a pension, we'll give you this, we'll give you that, if you join us. Can you do that? You have to die rather than be a Freemason. Stay away from it. And I know young men who have been approached by Freemasonry. And they promise everything. But we must have nothing to do with it. Freemasonry is Satan's army, one of, one of his ranks one of the ranks of his armies that fight against the Catholic Church. So, and one of the evils of it is they vow to secrecy. That's why it was condemned by over 15 popes, condemned Freemasonry. So, but yet their, their ideas have invaded our Catholic Church. And then you must also fight against continually the moral corruption, against abortion, contraception, divorce against the, uh, the rainbow agenda. We must fight these evils, great, great evils. And the state should be the one forbidding these things. That's why a, a Catholic state is our goal, that the state profess the Catholic faith and the reign of Christ the King. Then you won't have abortion, then you won't have euthanasia, you won't have the sodomite agenda, you won't have divorce legalized, you won't have contraception sold everywhere. You won't have the corruption of the young through pornography. You won't have legalization of marijuana and other drugs that destroy and, and smash the backbone of the young. But you would have a strong, healthy society. And, and just look at Catholic Spain. Look at once Catholic France. Look at once Catholic Europe, which was the age of Christendom, where Christ was proclaimed king over all the nations. And it was healthy, strong, vibrant, manly, and the women feminine. That was what's called Christendom. That was the great age of, of the kingship of Christ. And we still have the shells of that standing. People fly over to Europe a lot or, and see the beautiful cathedrals, the beautiful monasteries, the beautiful artwork which was produced in this age of the Catholic faith and the, the great age of the civil knight, of the knights, defending Christendom. The, the great soldiers who defended the glory of Christ the King. So, this is our rotten age, gentlemen. This is, we are in the age of apostasy. This is the age Our Lady foretold, the where the devils would be unleashed, 
and most souls will be swept by the tail of the dragon down into hell. And we're not, we're not uh, out of that danger as well. Many have fallen. I, I know many priests who have fallen. And I know a bunch of priests who are going with compromise and, and bishops. And you might know people too that have just lost the faith. Stop fighting for tradition. Stop fighting for Christ the King. It's a war. So a war means you get exhausted. A war means you get shot at. A war means you get pelleted with bullets and wounds and scars. But we're in war. And some people just get tired and they just give up. And they, It's easier for dead bodies to float downstream. And many just give up and float downstream. But no, we have to be trust in the grace of God and rely on His grace and constantly fight and swim against the current of this bad and evil age, this adulterous and wicked generation. And God will bless you. And there is, all over the world, there are many good traditional Catholics rebuilding. And maybe they don't see things so clearly yet. Many are in St. Peter's groups or in that group, our indult group. They just don't know. They should study. They should pray and read Archbishop Lefebvre and read St. Pius X to get a firmer clarity on, on the situation. But nevertheless, there's many good souls who are trying to rebuild and, and rebuild Catholic families, rebuild Catholic businesses. And, and lastly, and probably the most importantly, is the rebuilding of the Catholic Church, the salvation of souls. And this is where everybody can can do this, but especially the priests, brothers, and monks. And priests who won't compromise with Vatican II in the new Mass. This is what Archbishop Lefebvre called the Catholic resistance. He himself uses that word. We are resisting the destruction of our Catholic Church, the uncrowning of Christ the King. We resist and, and oppose and refuse the novelties of Vatican II in the new Mass. We must stand opposed to this. So we need an army of priests who are going to rebuild the church from the ground up of tradition without compromise. So pray to the Mother of God on, this, on these days of pilgrimage when we visit the churches. Pray to the Mother of God to know her God's will and to be strong in the faith and never to be compromises with the world. And should you trip and fall by sin and weakness, that you come right back up. Get right back up and make a humble act of contrition. And get to confession and keep fighting. It is true, the way to heaven is a lot about just getting back up again. Getting back up again. Getting back up again after you fall. That's called perseverance. <laughs> o Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us every person. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us every person. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us every person. And for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen.